I'm covering the exploitation phase of penetration tests, so that's why I'm giving you an overview of how, the, how these three concepts link together. So, another one disclaimer when it says the session is recorded and it's going to be uploaded to YouTube, as all the other lectures have, and they have now as well. So, if you want to check those out, they're now on the NetF Clark and have a YouTube channel. So, today's learning outcomes we're going to be understanding the concepts of a vulnerability, an exploit, and a payload how those elements fit together, so often it's quite difficult for new starters to understand how that does fit together. I'm going to go through how to use the exploit database, which is going to be your go-to for looking for exploits essentially. A few payload generation techniques. This isn't an absolute comprehensive guide on how to generate every payload in the world. It's essentially just a few of the most common practices used by pen testers, and probably the most heavily referenced out of the payload generation techniques as well. So firstly, vulnerabilities. Definition of a vulnerability is best categorized as a flaw in a system that can leave it open to attack, but it also can burst the computer system itself. So some common vulnerabilities that you'll see reference to buffer overflows, code injection, that comes in many different formats. Weak passwords, very critical vulnerability. Using weak cryptographic algorithms, so using either older hashing algorithms or just ones that are easy, easy to compute. Google website sanitation security, so things like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, so that's more on the web app side of things, is still, still absolutely relevant. I'm going to go through exploits now. So what is an exploit? So it's essentially it's a piece of code, but it doesn't always mean it's a piece of code. It can be cloning a card, um, an RFID card is also an exploit because you're exploiting a vulnerability in a system, so it's not always a piece of code. It could be a piece of software, data, or a sequence of command used to take advantage of vocal vulnerability. So that's a very generic definition, but that categorizes most things that would be uh, under an exploit. So common exploitation techniques, things such as malicious code and malware, phishing and sphere phishing. So phishing is a more generic term sent out to multiple users, and sphere phishing is a more direct approach to targeting individuals within companies. Cracking hash passwords. Man in the middle attacks, they come in many different forms as well. SQL injection, XSS, so just referencing as we referenced on the vulnerability section, pretty much the same things but how they're used in exploitation as opposed to the actual vulnerability itself. So now we're going to move on to payloads. So what are they? So what are payloads? Essentially, I've used a missile analogy because I think it's the best way to conceptualize this. So if you think of the missile, the exploit as the rocket and the fuel, then the warhead would be the payload. And without the warhead, the missile doesn't do very much. You can exploit something, but unless it's got something that you're delivering at the end of it, it's not really any use. So the common payloads you see used are both sides of the generic shell, so bind and reverse. Meterpreter, that's a very, very popular payload. It comes with much more advanced functionality, but it is very noisy and hard to obfuscate as well. And JavaScript payloads, so things you do in the web browser, so if there is a cross-site scripting vulnerability, you're going to attach a JavaScript payload to that. Among other things, it doesn't need to be JavaScript, but that's obviously the most commonly known about. So if you're confused about these things, I'm going to clarify it in one example that will pull all of these concepts together. So, I had vulnerable server running on my Windows 10 machine. You can download that if you just go to Google and type in vulnerable server you'll find a GitHub repository to it. And essentially, you just run it on your machine as admin. You have to do it as admin. You may need to turn Windows Defender off because sometimes it trips it, sometimes it doesn't. So quite often, you, you'll be running vulnerable server, and if you try to exploit it, it'll just close vulnerable server. So if you try and do the buffer overflow exploit, which we're going to show you, and it connects back with a, with a shell, then quite often Windows Defender will close the process and delete the file, and it, it won't let you execute that file anymore. So it is worth turning Defender off before you do anything with Vulnerable Server. Also, Kylinux comes with some exploitation code. How this works, so this whole buffer overflow example, this is the final result of a buffer overflow, so there is previous steps to that, finding the offset, omitting bad characters, etc. So there's a lot that goes into actually doing the buffer overflow. This is just a very simple example, and it's the final stage of the example. So in red, that's our payload. So that's what we've generated with MSF Venom, which we're going to show you at the end of the video. But that's that's a generic reverse shell payload that you can generate with MSF Venom. That's the shell code. Shell code it basically just refers to code that's used to gain a shell. So it's not a specific language in itself. 
So when you see shell code online, you might think, oh, it's a programming language, it's not a programming language, it's just referred to getting a shell from the code, essentially. So that's our payload in red, and our exploit code, so how these fit together, so that's the, the rocket and the fuel is at the bottom of the exploit code, and the warhead is the top, which is the payload. So the exploit code, just to very briefly explain that, it's shell code with our buffer, so that's our buffer space, and then there's the EIP memory address, some padding, and then our exploit, exploit shell code. So you'll see the exploit shell code there, variable. That's what we're using at the end. So it's buffer space, the EIP, which tells it to jump to a space in memory, and then execute our exploit shell code. So that's it in a nutshell. So that line is the main bit, and the bottom part, the socket connection. So we're using the Python sockets library, and that's just saying connect on localhost, because I was, I was using it on the same machine. So Python and vulnerable server were running on a Windows 10 box and I was just executing the Python so that's why I'm using the local host address the 127.0.0.1 address vulnerable server listens out on port 9999 and so all connections to it will go through port 9999 and also we're set same is trun and then we're executing our shell code so trun is just a command within vulnerable server that we need to execute this essentially and if it doesn't work, you'll get something back saying check debugger. So yeah, just very quickly go back over that. Payload at the top, that's our exploit shell code generated through MSF Venom, which we're going to cover at the end. Our exploit code, which is mainly that main line there, and that's how we're sending the exploit code. It's a very, very basic piece of code. So this is a demo of the buffer overflow in action. Play that video. Okay, so I'm just going to go through a quick buffer overflow example. So I'm just going to show you what our Python exploitation code looks like. Show you what this looks like. So this this here is the payload. So this is what we're going to be delivering to the system once we've exploited it. And this little piece of code here, that's what actually does the buffer overflow. So essentially it's finding the point in memory in which it can jump to our exploitation code. That's just a little bit of padding there. That's the um, little endian um, memory address. So it's, it's that address up there, but backwards, to it in little endian. And then our shell code, and our shell code variable is up here. So we've got our vulnerable server running on our Windows box. And now we're going to start a listener using netcat. So we'll go netcat, mvlp, port 4444. Because when we generated this shell code, we generated it to respond back to our attacker machine on port 4444 and with obviously the local host of this card machine. So now that that's listening, what we're going to do is we're going to run our Python code. So just to explain a little bit of how this contacts the vulnerable server, it's using the sockets library in Python. So we're telling it to contact this IP address on this port number, because that's the port number that the vulnerable server is listening to. And when this code executes on this machine, it then responds back on port 4444. The phone server is just the port that we're using to contact. Um, uh, sorry, port 9999 is just the port number that we're using to contact vulnerable server. So we're going to run the Python script now. 6.py. And what you'll see when I run this is you'll see I'll get a first shot. There we go. So now I've got, who am I? I am random GMV. It's just the name of my PC. It's the user account. So that's it, so that's a buffer overflow example using the um, concepts we've explained, vulnerability exploitation and payload. Thank you. So yeah, I hope that made sense to everybody. I'm just gonna to skip to the end of the video there, just to explain that last bit. Does, uh, does shell code change depending on the exploit that you use? It will change in size, absolutely. So that's a generic reverse shell. Yeah. So it's, you're literally giving it an IP address and a part number to contact it on and then the payload itself is the reverse shell. So yeah, that's a very small payload. Um, depending, I'm gonna cover this on the, the last slide, but depending on how many iterations of encoding you use, is how big, it, how big it can actually get. So that's, I think that was around about 200 bytes, that shell code, very, very small. Um, so yeah, I'll just explain that last bit again, just in case <coughs> it wasn't um, clear in the video. But when we, when we execute with that in the, the top right, NC, NVLP444, so I'm just telling Netcat to listen on port 444, uh, 4444 in, for this incoming payload. So this is the payload here, and that's been written to contact this IP address on port 4444. So when I run python6.py, 
it runs this, it's, that's, the exploit is there, it runs the exploit and then it runs it jumps to the point of memory, runs the shell code, and then we get access to the machine. So that's my Kali Linux box with access to my Windows 10 machine. Does that make sense to everybody? Fairly, fairly, it's, it's not fairly straightforward, but it is, it's, it's, it's as basic as you can get when you pull these things together. So you've got an exploit, uh, the vulnerability, which is the buffer overflow, the vulnerable server is vulnerable to a buffer overflow attack, the exploit is our Python code, and the payload is our shell code. So we're moving on now, um, we'll go through, so we're going to go through exploit DB, so how do you find exploitation code? This is again, this is just going to be a video. We'll be covering the exploit DB website alongside SearchSploit, which is a tool in Kali Linux, which I actually prefer. Okay, so in this video, we're going to be covering the exploit database. The exploit database is a repository that's maintained by the offensive security team, so the people who are in charge of um, updating this distribution, um, the Kali Linux distribution. Um, so what we're going to do, um, we're going to go straight to the Exploit Database website and just give you an overview of how to use the site. So we've got four main sections of the site that you should be concerned about. First one is the Exploit Database. So as it is, it's just a database of exploits. So we can search for something like MS17, which I've just previously searched for, which is obviously the WannaCry um, exploit. So as you can see there, we've got Microsoft Windows, Eternal Romance, Eternal Synergy, Eternal Champion, SMB, Remote Code Execution. So I believe this is the link to the Metasploit code file. Yes, it is. Um, so the main thing to notice about these exploit pages is you have two options. You can either just download the exploit itself, or you can view raw, take certain sections of it if you need to. It really depends on what you're looking at and what, you, what you're using the code for. So you can use either raw or you can download it. So as I've said, it has a search tool. It's also got filters, so you can look for specific platforms. You can also look for specific types, so local exploits, remote exploits, web apps, web app exploits. Um, that's pretty much it for the search function. It's, it's really dependent on what you're wanting to search for and what its intended use is. So that's it for exploits. So now we'll go down to the Google Hacking Database. So if you're familiar with Google Darking, this is where pretty much every form of Google Dark that's worth something, that's worth anything, um, will be will be in here. Um, you'll have seen a fair few online. If you follow quite a lot of the hacking forums, you'll have seen examples of Google Darking. But this is just a repository of the most interesting ones, essentially. Um, another one is the papers. So if you're interested in, say, like on a cross-site scripting, put XS in, XSS in there, you could read papers and journals in relation to those specific topics. It's really interesting if you just want to re want to research um, around a topic, just because it's, it's, you can search through Google, but essentially you're going to find the ones that have um, got the highest SEO values. So people, um, for instance, like blog posts. Um, I can't recall the name of the other site. There is another site that appears nearly every time you search for anything in relation to the old bike. hacking. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't matter about that. Um, so yeah, it's also got papers and you can also search for raw shell code. So we'll just click on one, give you an example. It's essentially going to be. So that's just an example of some shell code there. So it's similar to what we've seen in the buffer overflow video. So that's how you search the website itself. Um, the next thing we're going to go through is the search exploit tool, which is essentially just the exploit database, but this time it's through the terminal and it's also offline. So um, to summon the search exploit tool, as you can imagine, you can just type in search and tab complete and you'll get search exploit. So on the right side of the screen there, you've noticed that I'm actually in the location within Kali Linux that contains all of the exploit DB exploits anyway. So you could just list that <coughs> and go through anything you want. So you could see the Windows, LS, local dots, remote web apps. So that's essentially the same thing. So we'll go, let's say if we were for CD local, LS, it's going to be just hundreds of exploits in there. 
Um, so we're going to use the search exploit tool now. That was just to show you where these are actually located within Kali Linux, because it is useful to know that. Um, go back to exploits. So we've got the search exploit tool. Um, the first thing you're going to want to do is update the tool. So you just do search exploit, tack u or dash u, however you want to, however you want to say it. So that's just going to pull in the updates. So it says it's already up to date there. Um, now we're going to we're going to search for SMB. So we'll go off search exploit. This is the most basic search you can do. So you can have, you can type in anything Windows SMB XSS. There's, there's also anything you anything you're looking for. You can search, you can type into that. So we'll just search for SMB, and it's going to show us all the SMB exploits that are available. It should also show us the papers at the top if there is any on this one. So you usually get papers and then exploit title. So that's just the link to the the path. So that's the base path that we've got over here. User share exploit DB, and then the path within the exploit database itself. So that's if you just want to pull um, the raw code. I find the easiest thing to do is to show the ID, and then use the ID number um, to specify a path. So how we do that is we go search exploit uh, SMB tac tac ID. And you can get the ID number on the right hand side here. And then to get and then to get the link to the web address and the code, you just use tac p, which is path. So let's say for instance we use we'll go for this one. Tree connect. So we'll take that number, 41222, copy that. Come down here, search point. So the last one we did was SMB tac tac ID. Now this time we're just going, to, just going to give it the number, so we're going to go tac p and then paste our number and uh, press enter. So what this is going to do is give us all the details for that exploit. I actually prefer using search exploit to the exploit database, I just find it much easier to use. One, because it highlights everything for you. There's this quite a lot of parameters that you can use as well. Um, just have a look on the man page. Oh, I think you can just type in h as well. Yeah, you can. So you can have it in JSON format. Um, path is what we've been using. Uh, that's another interesting one as well, tap W, which will just give you the link. But anyway, we'll go back to the, the last command that we did. So tap you 41222, so Microsoft, Microsoft Windows 10, SMB v, v3 tree connect, that's the URL, so we will just be on the exploit database. So if we click on that, we're just going to get the uh, web version of this exploit. The path to the exploit, so we can just navigate to that path, or we can copy the, copy the raw code and then tells you the file type as well. So that is pretty much it for searching for exploits um, on Kali Linux. These are the only ones I use anyway, and I've never really had a problem based from this. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I don't think I actually mentioned it in the video, but um, search exploit is offline as well, so it's very, very useful. Um, I, I genuinely do prefer just updating that and just using search exploit as opposed to going to, go to the exploit database. It's just easier to use. You can just search for the ID numbers and get what you need straight away. Um, and I like the way it highlights the text as well. <laughs> so, now we're going to go into generating payloads. So, this is the shellcode part. So, we go back to so that top part there, the red part, the shellcode. This is what we're going to be generating here. So, we've just covered exploit database and getting exploitation code. Obviously, a lot of the exploitation code might come with its own payload, um, but it, it really depends on um, what you're looking at. Spot. And obviously you can ha you can add your own exploits into Metasploit as well. Um, I'm going to cover that in a later lecture. But you can take some exploitation code online and you can put it in a template file from Metasploit. So you can create your own parameters if you really want to. And it really depends on what the exploit um, is doing. So we'll go back to where we were, generating payloads. So we're going to use Unveil and MSF Venom. That payload that we see in the buffer overflow was used from MSF Venom. It was just a generic payload shellcode, dropped into the Python script and ran against the vulnerable server. Go to our next video. This is Veil and MSF. Welcome to another video. In today's video, we're going to be covering pay payload generation techniques or shellcode generation techniques. We're primarily going to be focusing on the Veil framework and the Metasploit framework. We'll go through two different possibilities with the Metasploit framework. Achieve exactly the same thing, but in different ways. One uses what I would call a GUI, um, the, um, the MSF console, and the other one just uses the command line with command line like arguments. 
So first we'll start with Veil. If you aren't familiar with Veil or you've never heard of it, essentially it's just a framework that's used to generate executable files which obfuscate, um, which are obfuscated. Um, and when you run these executable files, generally they won't be picked up by an antivirus vendor. How you achieve that um, and, and what you do what you do with the payload after that. Some, there's some things that can trigger um, the AV, um, but regardless, that's for a completely different video. So we're gonna start with Veil. Um, so we're gonna use Veil Tap T and type specify ordnance list payloads just to show what payloads are available within Veil. So we've got reverse TCP First HTTPS, first HTTP, bind TCP, TCPL ports, and TCP DNS. We're just going to focus on reverse TCP for this specific um, example. So to generate some reverse TCP shell, shell code, we go veil tap T and then ordnance again. And this time we're going to type ordnance tap payload. Specify the payload, which is reverse TCP and the IP address to talk to. So what IP address are we attempting to contact with this, with this shell code, which is 192.168.0.10, our Kali distribution. And the port number to talk back on will be 4444. So that's generated this shell code right here. And it essentially just gives you exactly what you've given it back, uh, what, what you put in the parameters. So in, in order as well. So we've We've selected a reverse TCP stager. We've got an IP address of this, or of this, and the shellcode size, and the actual shellcode itself. So there is other parameters you can use. So if we go to veil tap h, which is its command page, we can see that you can emit bad characters. So like the universal bad character of a null byte, you can specify specific encoders. You can also list the encoders, so you can list the encoders before choosing an encoder. You might be more familiar with that with Metasploit framework, things like um, Shikita Gainaya, I think the bullet, I believe the payload, uh, the very popular payload um, encoder is called. So that's pretty much it for Veil. Uh, the reason I showed you that is because it's, it's it's really intuitive. It's under it's it's, it's easy it's easy to understand, um, and it's a very clean output. So you sort of just know what's going on. So if you're a beginner and you've never ever generated any shell code before, it's definitely a good thing to start with. So now that we've covered Veil, we'll move on to the MSF Venom utility, or tool. So MSF Venom, it's used for payload generation. Uh, we're going to generate a reverse shell, uh, a reverse TCP shell, pretty much the same parameters, a, a few extra switches here and there, but nothing too complex. So MSF Venom, payload windows, shell, reverse, TCP, localhost, so where we put IP with Veil, we're going to be using localhost, same thing, 192.168.0.10, local port is equal to 4444, exit funk is generally used for stability, oh that's why, that's what people tell me. But it's generally used for stability. Um, the formats of the output for the shellcode, there is pretty much every language is supported. You can put it in any way you want. We're just going to use C. Uh, the architecture, which is x86. And we are going to emit some bad characters this time. So we will put tap B and specify the bad characters. So like I said, the universally bad character of a null byte. We are going to be covering a um, full in-depth review of a buffer overflow which will explain these bad characters uh, in, in depth and, and give you a better understanding as to why you need to admit bad characters but for now um, we're just going to show you the payload generation tool so we're just going to om omit the um, null byte character and that's it so that should generate the shell code providing I haven't made any typos which I don't believe I have so there you go, it's um, automatically sh uh, chose the Shikita, Shikata Gai Nai. I don't really know how to pronounce that, but that's my attempt at pronouncing it. Uh, again, it gives you the payload size. Like I say, it's a little bit, it's it's not as, it's not overly complex, but it's not as a clean output as what, what Veil gives you. 
We've got our shell code at the bottom, which you'll probably be very familiar with um, what uh, how that looks there, because we've, we've showed you a, uh, the buffer overflow um, exploit code, which is, it generates, uh, we generated the exact, exact same code as, as above. Um, and that obviously talks back to our netcat listener. Um, so that's the um, reverse TCP um, payload. So now what we're going to do is we're going to generate a different payload, but this time we're going to be using a interpreter shell. So if we go back to our payload, go to Windows x86 64, sorry, and interpreter and reverse TCP. And we'll need to move, remove that architecture. Now if we run that, we'll essentially just get a interpreter shell code payload. And there we go. It is bigger because it's a interpreter shell code. Um, it's, it's, a, it's done exactly the same thing, except this time we've, um, we've generated a interpreter payload. So that's how to do it through MSF Venom. You can choose whichever payload you want. Again, there's, it's, there is more functionality with MSF Venom. Uh, sorry, my MSF Venom. So we do have, we've co covered most in there, but you can choose a specific amount of iterations. However, if you iterate it too many times, or the more you iterate it, the higher the payload gets. Now there is, there is people online who will tell you the more you encode it, is the less likely it's going to be picked up by the antivirus system, which is primarily um, debunked at this stage. You can try it with fifty iterations, and I can guarantee you, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna make it more secure because <clears throat> specific encoders have specific patterns of doing things, and that's what the antivirus um, vendor picks up on. So if you see that online, just ignore it because it's it's false. Um, yeah, so we've covered that. There is extra switches, but that's just a basic functionality um, of this tool. So have a mess around with that in your own time. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use there's no one there. Uh, we're going to use the MSF console, so you can spawn that just by typing MSF console. But we've already got it open, but it's just an example there. Just put MSF console. Um, so essentially, what we're going to do now is select a payload. So we'll come through. Um, and we'll use the the Windows shell bind TCP shell bind TCP. That'll bring that payload up for us. And again, it's, it's I see I, people say it's not a GUI, but I'm gonna call it a GUI because I, I, I would consider this a GUI. We have missed a forward slash there. So we'll put forward slash there. And that should pick that up. So if we go to generate tack H, it'll give us any of the parameters. And as you can see, it's very similar to the man page we've got above. So you can force encoding, um, and it, you can pretty much do exactly the same thing. Um, omit the bad characters, etc. That's the format output. So as I said, it pretty much supports everything it virtually does. You've got Java, Hex, JavaScript, um, Bash, Python will be in there, C will be in there, Ruby's in there. So there's, there's, it'll generate as many formats as you need, essentially. But um, just for that example, we used C. Um, so yeah, the basic things it's going to need is the local host. So if you type, try and type generate, it's already it picks it up for, for me because I've already um, specified these things. But you essentially you need to set the local host to say 192.168.0.10. Set the local port. So whatever the parameters are for that specific payload, and you can see that by typing via typing show options. Um, that's what you're going to need to put in to generate the shell code, or to generate the shell code that's going to be useful to you. Um, so once you've once you've once you've inputted the correct parameters or the correct options, you literally just type in generate. So it's it's easier to use um, than than remembering all these specific switches on here because you can just go, oh, which ones do I need? Okay, yeah, I need to these ones. I need to input these ones, so you put those ones and click generate. So it's it's much easier to understand than this. However, you should really get used to using the command line as well, um, rather than this um, 
MSF console.